if you take your Bibles and open up to the book of Hebrews, we're continuing our journey through the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 5, looking at verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 12. As I've uh, mentioned several times, the writer of Hebrews is trying to make sure that the um, Jewish uh, people who have come to faith in Christ don't revert back and go back to Judaism. They are tempted to do that because of the persecution that they're facing on all sides. Persecution for the Gentiles because the Romans don't like them. Um, in fact, Nero is, is probably Caesar of Rome about this particular time, and he hates Christians, has been lighting them up in the arenas, feeding them to the gladiators and to the lions. Well, the gladiators wouldn't eat them, but... <laughs> it's not been pleasant in the arena. Um... And so they've been tempted to go back to their, to their Jewish roots. And he's told them uh, in no uncertain terms that Jesus is superior to the prophets. Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to the angels. Jesus is superior to Aaron. Jesus is superior to, to uh, Joshua. Uh, now he's going to an extended period of time in, in explaining that Jesus is superior to the priesthood. We've already had two Sundays from chapter 4 and the early part of chapter 5 in which uh, the writer of Hebrews has been um, trying to, to get them to see that Jesus is superior to the priesthood. In fact, He's interrupting his argument that Jesus is superior to the priesthood in order to tell them, listen, I, I'd love to share with you a lot of insights, but you, you, you're just not growing up. And I can't share these kind of insights with you because <laughs> you just go over your head and it'll be wasted space. So he's pulling back a little bit to scold them. And boy, is, does we, do we as 21st century American Christians need to hear the warnings that the writer of Hebrews is giving them because a lot of, well, I'd like to suggest all of the warnings apply to us. We are very superficial in our faith. Um, in fact, if you look at the things that the, the writer of Hebrews is pointing out are, as the elementary things, they're the things that we fight over. These are supposed to be basic things. We're not supposed to be fighting over them. It's like two plus two is four. What's, what's the big deal? No, it's got to be five. No, I think it's one. Well, grow up and be free Methodist and know it's four. <laughs> oh, but free Methodists are going to take a hit today too. So the writer of Hebrews is pulling back from his argument of how Jesus is superior to the priesthood. And I'm going to cover it all on this day because it's pretty painful. Um, and I don't want to subject you to, to, especially as we come into fall and it could get cold and snowy and you're already going to be depressed. I don't want to add to your depression by having several Sundays in a row of having you be scolded by the writer of Hebrews. And nobody's saying, thank you, Pastor Keith. It just, um, I definitely didn't want to cover this in February. Because it's a depressing text. So we're covering the entire section from 511 to, through 612 today, even though it deserves about five or six sermons. There are a lot of issues that I'm not even going to be able to touch. In fact, if you listen carefully, I'll say maybe a sentence about them. But they're, they're all issues that are d deserving of lots of wrestling with. But I'm going to encourage you to learn to wrestle with the Word of God on your own. Because, folks, I can't spoon-feed you all of my life. I'm getting older. And I can't be with you. You need to learn to wrestle with God's word on your own. That's what it means to grow up. That's what it means. When you were a baby, your mother... Okay, your mother didn't do that? I did it with my kids. Why? Because they were immature. You had to help them eat. But if you're still being spoon-fed at 45, that's not pretty. I don't go to my wife and go, here, baby, baby, baby. Mm. <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> And yet, the Apostle Paul had to wrestle with the same thing with the Corinthians. And the writer of Hebrews is wrestling with the same thing here in Hebrews chapter 6. 
Um, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 is probably one of the most troubling passages in all of Scripture. Just recently at Wednesday night Bible study, um, one of the, the attendees to that study shared where um, one of the, her family members had come across this text and was absolutely devastated. We need to wrestle with the text. And some of you are going to come from presuppositions that force you to think one way. Some of you are going to come from presuppositions that force you to think completely the opposite way. I'm going to tell you to abandon all your presuppositions and listen to the Spirit of God, which is not me. I'm going to hopefully open up the windows of possibility for you all that the Spirit of God can use you to... to, um, come to a, the truth, but I don't, I don't claim by any stretch of the imagination to say, thus saith the Lord about uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Um, one other thing, real quickly. The, the elementary things that he talks about is repentance from dead works, which is, uh, means that we, we have faith in God and that we're not looking to our obedience to be the righteousness that we are going to bring before God because... <laughs> we don't have any. Um, we are 100% dependent upon the God of the universe and the righteousness of his sin, son, Jesus, and him accounting to us his righteousness in order for us to have righteousness before God. And that's one of the basic things that the writer of Hebrews is saying. You still haven't discovered that. And once you come to a more comprehensive understanding of the full extent of Jesus' priesthood to you, then your understanding of what the writer of Hebrews is saying is basic in order for you to come to maturity in the faith will be more evident to you and you'll be able to come more, more mature, more complete. You'll be able to grow up. And that's why we're going to spend a lot of time between now and almost Christmas talking about the high priest of, of uh, Jesus in our lives because it's what is necessary for us to grow up. Listen very, very carefully as Matthew Weaver comes and reads from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, all the way through 6, verse 12. Batten down the hatches. Will you please stand for God's word? You have been warned. Here it comes. <laughs> Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 12. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have trust, who, excuse me, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. God's word. You may be seated. So you know, in verse 11, slow to learn, and in verse 12, lazy, 
is the same Greek word. Just translated differently in order to uh, show you the full range of meaning of that particular word. This whole, that's one of the reasons why I chose this entire passage to handle it in one, uh, one setting because it's the same idea all the way through. That's why I gave you as a, in fact, why don't you pull out your sermon outline and follow on. I actually am going to be referring to it a lot. That's why I chose as a, the um, service orientation. Like a farmer in his field in a, is a Christian faith in his faith. If Christians are not diligent to attend to their spiritual lives and move to maturity, then you will deteriorate just like a farmer in his field. I believe the entire passage is talking about don't be lazy. Don't be ignorant. Don't be slothful. Buck up. Realize that there's a lot of things you have to wrestle with in order to understand. And you may never understand them. But God can give you a sense of beings. God can give you a sense of peace about those passages and live with them even though you don't cognitively understand them. And that's what I think a lot of what the writer of Hebrews is asking us to do in this particular passage. Um, Buck up. Um, I don't know how much you you, uh, do gardening or uh, have flower beds or you're a farmer, but you cannot ignore the ground very long without it taking over. You have to show due diligence in weeding it and preparing it and keeping it uh, fertile or it'll deteriorate on you with neglect. Um... takes hard work. When I was uh, younger, my dad told me when we disc, we don't disc much anymore, although now that organic is coming back, it's disking is coming back. That's a whole other story. If you want to talk to me about that later, you can, although I don't fully understand it myself. Um, We would disc fields because we didn't have Roundup. Roundup hadn't been invented yet, or if it had, we weren't using it. Um, and so we had to disc in order to turn the weeds under the ground. And every time we made a pass with our disc, it was not like Hillsdale Fields. Um, we had to stop and pick up the rock and put it on our disc. You obviously have not looked at Hillsdale's Fields. <laughs> After a good rain, if you looked at a newly cultivated or, or turned over field, there are 10 domes everywhere. Those are all rocks. You go to my far- family farm in Blissfield, you'd be lucky to ever find a rock. Why? Because my dad forced me, and my uncle forced his children, my other uncle forced his children, and my other brothers, and my sister, all were instructed, if you find a rock any bigger than a softball, you get off the tractor, stop the, stop the tractor first. <laughs> get off the tractor pick up the rock and put it in a little cage that we had on top of the, of the disc and make sure that that, why? Why would we go to all that due diligence to take the rock out? Plants don't grow on rocks. And the higher percentage of soil to rocks, the better the crops grow. And the ground that we work in Blissfield, Michigan is some of the best ground in the world. In fact, Seed corn companies come to my brother's fields and purposely plant plant their test plots in my brother's fields. Why? Because they know that my brother's soil will give them the best possible results. Nobody in the world can get the results they get, but they can advertise them as, we got this many bushels per acre off this field. Well, it was the best soil in the ground, in the planet. But we were required to stop the tractor, pick up the rock, and put it, Why? to do due diligence, to keep the... And we would have to go up and down the the, uh, rows and hoe every single weed. Why? Because we didn't want the weeds robbing of the the plants we wanted to grow of moisture and nutrients. We were trying to keep the soil as fertile. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 13, the first 25 verses of chapter 13. There are four different kinds of soil. What kind of soil are you cultivating in your heart to grow? So that when the word of God, the seed of God is planted in your hearts, will you flourish and and grow or will the seed die because the soil's not been nurtured? That's a lot of what's going on here. 
The writer of Hebrews is encouraging us not to be lazy about our faith, not to be dull or ignorant about giving yourself due diligence in order to pursue the God of the universe so you can begin to understand the more important things that he wants to share with us. So the question before the house is this. What is the writer of Hebrews attempted to do in Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 12? I believe he is doing this. He is warning Christians of the potentially fatal end of those who are lazy, dull, ignorant, or undisciplined. In fact, that slow to learn lazy word that's used in the, the first and last verses of the text, that's the same Greek word, means all those things. He is warning Christians of the potentially fatal end of those who are lazy, dull, ignorant, or undisciplined in regard to their spiritual growth. And you, just like anything else, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's true in the physical realm, it's true in the sports realm, it's true in the intellectual realm, it's true in the spiritual realm. If you don't use your faith, and I know some of you from the Reformed tradition are going, Pastor Keith, how can you say that? You, you know, haven't you ever heard of the perseverance of the faith? Oh, don't tell me that. I was formally trained in the Reformed tradition. I sat 12 years under, under a Lutheran pastor. Don't, don't throw that back at me. I have learned to drop the traditions and listen solely to God's word. <laughs> but Pastor Keith, you're a free Methodist. Free Methodists are wrong as well. I won't elaborate. <laughs> I like my job. Yes, I will. <laughs> 30 years ago, the Free Methodist Church was exactly in the point of immaturity that the writer of Hebrews is saying you should not be in anymore. They had become very legalistic, they had become assured that your righteousness was when women didn't wear jewelry, when we didn't have an organ in the church. This is a little longer than 30 years ago. This is like 50 years ago. Um, when you didn't play billiards, we didn't play with face cards, and you didn't date a woman who did any of those things. And God forbid, oh, I, I will go there. That would be a big can of worms that we could fish all day and we wouldn't get where we need to be. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Traditions are good as far as they help you to understand the scriptures. But can I tell you this right up front? Every tradition is based upon man's understanding of the scriptures and every tradition has gaps in its theological position. Every one. I was born and raised an Arminian. I'm in an Arminian church now and there are huge problems with their system, systematic theology. I was formally trained as a, as a, in the Reformed tradition, sat under the teaching of a Reformed uh, teacher for 12 years and I can assure you they have huge gaps in their system as well. If you're trusting in man and a tradition to give you the truth of God, you're going to always end up shortchanged. Look to Jesus. Well, Keith, you've got to keep preaching or you're never going to get through this and people are going to be ticked. Don't stand still! I would like to read this uh, quote by William Bennett. William Bennett was Secretary of Education, I believe under President Reagan, if you ever get a chance to read any of, his, any of his stuff, it is absolutely wonderful. He had such a wonderful perspective on the Christian faith and how Christians need to be active in the world, what it means to have a Christian education, what it means to have a good education. No wonder he was Secretary of Education. But he had to say this as he was talking to the um, Heritage Foundation, wasn't it? Heritage Foundation way back in 97 or something like that. This is what he has to say. I submit to you that the real crisis of our time, this is 20 years ago, 21 years ago. I submit to you that the real crisis of our time is spiritual. Specifically, our problem is what the uh, ancients called acedia. 
Acedia is a sin of sloth, but acedia is understood by the saints of old as not laziness about life's affairs, which is what we normally think sloth to be, but acedia is something else. Properly understood, acedia is an aversion to and negation of spiritual things. Acedia reveals itself in an undue concern for external affairs and worldly things. Acedia is spiritual torpor, dullness, an absence of zeal for divine things, and it brings with it, according to the ancients, a sadness and sorrow of the world. Acedia manifests itself in man's joyless, ill-tempered, and self-seeking rejection of the nobility of the children of God. The slothful man hates the spiritual, and he wants to be free of its demands. The old theologians taught that acedia arises from a heart steeped in the worldly and carnal and from a low esteem of divine things. It eventually leads to a hatred of the good altogether. And with hatred comes more rejection, more ill temper, sadness, and sorrow. Folks, I believe after 21 years, we are farther down that road than what it was when he said this originally way back in 1997 or whatever it was. 93, 93, boy, such insight. We have to give attention to the spiritual things. We have to fight in order to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil, and our own flesh is an enemy with ourselves in understanding spiritual things. You need to learn to wrestle with God's word, wrestle with your own presuppositions, wrestle with what the world is trying to shove down your throat about what God is trying to tell you. Words for the day is grow. Grow. Okay, number one. What warnings do we get in this section of Hebrews? One, spiritual growth and maturity cannot be pursued by the low, lazy, dull, ignorant, or undisciplined. You will not grow if you're not willing to work. We have much to say about this, verses 11 and following in chapter 5. But it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. You're dull, you're ignorant, you're lazy. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary t truths of God's word all over again. You want to read about a church that was uh, mired in this slowness, this dullness? Read 1 Corinthians. <laughs> you know, I always get amazed. There are churches within 30 miles of my voice that call themselves Church of the Corinthians. And I said, why would anybody label themselves with that name? Why not say the Church of the Idiots? <laughs> Gee, I got some people looking at me like, maybe your church is called that. <laughs> Read 1 Corinthians. Look at the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers, this is what Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready for it. There's a great model for us to all, I, I want to be a Corinthian. I'm going to bail myself out by this quote from John MacArthur. When we do not trust and act on any God, part of God's work, truth that we know, we become hardened to it. It's in your sermon outline. We become hardened to it and less and less likely to benefit from it. Or when we devoid delving into the deeper parts of God's word, being satisfied with the basics, we insulate ourselves from the Holy Spirit to that extent. Read 1 Corinthians and look at the huge, silly problems that they had because they were dull to the Spirit of God, and yet they prided themselves in being in touch with the Spirit. They didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue of what it meant to be in touch with the Spirit. Otherwise, they would have known what we're going to learn later on in this message, the difference between good and evil. 
over and over and over again in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is saying, now on this problem, now on this problem, now on this problem, now on this problem. Oy vey. Okay, we need to go on. No, we don't. I believe the writer of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul wants us to wrestle with the text because there's something inherent in the wrestling that makes it more a part of who we are when we wrestle with something. I'd like to use this illustration. Just imagine a 20K mountain, 20,000 feet mountain. And there are two people who go to the top of that mountain. One who has a backpack and a tent and for a week goes through the snow and the weather and the steep terrain and the, the danger and the hazards and makes it to the top of the mountain. The other person takes a helicopter, they go up, drops them off, they look around, they get back in the helicopter and go down. Which of those two people is going to appreciate the top of the mountain more? You all would agree the first guy that wrestled with it, right? Why? It's the same view. There's something inherent about wrestling with the issue that brings it to us more and makes it more a part of us and makes it more vibrant. Do you do that with God's word? If you take my sermon outlines and read them and think, well, I've mastered that text, you're an idiot. Well, I shouldn't have said that. Yes, I should. Number two, what warnings do we get in this section of Hebrews? Two, those who are persistently pursuing spiritual maturity acquire wisdom, discernment, and good judgment. This is huge. 514, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Uh, this quote by Bruce Barton, it's in your sermon outline. Interestingly, those who are called mature, those who have now been completed are mature because they have disciplined themselves, who by constant use have trained themselves, they have disciplined themselves on solid food as they have learned about and appropriated the high priestly role of, of Christ. Spiritually mature Christians constantly examine themselves, turn away from sin, and learn what actions, thoughts, and attitudes will please God. These people have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The Greek word for train gives the athletic imagery of training through much practice. When I was a freshman in high school, I ran cross country. I made the varsity team because there were six of us on the team. There's seven that make up a team. <laughs> so I was on varsity. I got my varsity letter. I was ready to go. I was ready to discipline myself because I was a varsity athlete as a freshman in high school. And my coach said to me, Keith, your feet go like this every time you take a step. You're wasting energy because your legs are all over the place. Just look, and we, our, Mrs. Michigan, so the final race uh, is usually the first one I ever remember, and it was snowing, and he, said, he took me back and says, look at your tracks in the snow. They're like this, they're all over the place. That entire winter, I went early in the morning and walked the lines of the gymnasium for an hour every day before school to get my feet trained to go straight. I dropped about a minute and a half off of my cross country time just by straightening my steps. Why? I wasn't wasting energy. How many of you in your, how many of me, how many, how about me too? <laughs> us. Us is a good word. I've trained my wife to, <laughs> to bail me out. <laughs> we all need that in our spiritual life. We're wasting energy in our spiritual lives, chasing things that are futile, that are not going to help us at all. We all need to discipline ourselves with the things that will improve us, that allow us to become more mature so that we can distinguish between good and evil. And folks, in 21st century America, there is a lot of things by which we need to for which 
That we need to determine what is good or evil. And folks, it may change from situation to situation because of the technology that is available to us that forces us to make decisions that could be life-changing. I'll never forget uh, a couple at Addison, their, their uh, mother had gotten very, very ill with bronchitis. In fact, um, she was struggling just to breathe. The, the congestion was so thick. And the doctors came to her, came to the, the children and said, you know, if we give your mother a drug-induced coma and breathe for her and put her on life support for two weeks, this bronchitis will leave her, we can clean out her lungs, and she'll have a brand new life all over again. The problem was the mother had a do not uh, put on life support in her, in her will. And it told the kids, don't ever put me on life support. They did. They came to me first and said, Pastor Keith, what do we do? The doctor's telling us that she can be better after two weeks. All we have to do is violate her will. And I gave them the wonderful counsel of this. You do what you think's right and I'll support you. I was helpless to help him. I did not have the wisdom, maturity. I had not grown up enough to be able to tell them the difference between good and evil. And you're saying, well, there's no good or evil here. I think we need to hear the Spirit of God. And I think every case is different. I think it is. You're saying, what happened to the lady? Uh, they put her in a drug-induced coma, put her on life support for two weeks, and she died. And one of the last things he, she did before she came out from her coma is tell her kids, I, I. Listen, there is technology all over the place that we need to wrestle with. Is it good or evil? And I can't tell you the answer. But God can. And that's why you desperately need God's word. And that's why you desperately need the spirit of God to give you understanding of God's word for that particular situation. And some of you are thinking, well, why didn't God just spell it all out in his word? Really? Have you thought about every possible contingency of a decision in all the world and all the cultures for all time periods? The, the Bible would be the size of a state of Connecticut. Maybe even Rhode Island. No, Rhode Island is smaller. We need God's word. I, I have this quote by Alistair Begg. It's a wonderful quote. When there is all word and no spirit, the people tend to dry up. And you know of churches that are that way. They're faithful to God's word, have no spirit at all. When there is all spirit and no word, the people tend to blow up. <laughs> I'd love to comment, but the spirit of God is telling me, don't you dare. <laughs> but when there is both spirit and word, the people tend to grow up. We need the word and the spirit to become mature and complete. Number three, what warnings do we get in this section of Hebrews? If you have enjoyed spiritual insight, blessings, and security, and you neglect, reject, and despise it all, then you will find it impossible to come back to the faith. This is one of the most troubling passages in all of scripture. Let me read it to you again. It is impossible for those, this is Hebrews chapter six, verses four through six. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. I want to read this quote by uh, George Guthrie before I even make any comment because he's spot on. Whether we come from a tradition that affirms perseverance of the saints or one that holds apostasy as possible for all true believers, we tend to seize on those word meanings that seem to support our position. 
Integrity demands that we consider carefully as much data as possible when attempting to arrive at an interpretation and open ourselves to the arguments of others who have grappled with the text. I have about 32, 35 different commentaries that I consult and they are equally divided on all sorts of different traditions. <laughs> And they have all sorts of different explanations about what this text means. Why? Because they're driven by their presuppositions. They're driven by their tradition to say certain things. Beware. You all have a tradition. You may even have a tradition that's not traditional. But you still have a non-traditional tradition. Beware of what your tradition is forcing you to see or not see. I don't know if you remember, there was about five or eight, nine, ten, several weeks ago, um, the news, suddenly people woke up to the fact that news reporters aren't always accurate. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and I remember several stations taking time, instead of running commercials, several stations giving um, assurance to you all that they were going to be fair and unbiased and that they were going to give the news as just facts. And they weren't going to use their bias and or, there was going to be any coloring in the news at all. There was going to be factual news. And I remember screaming, to you, no, you can't. It's not possible. We will always color information that comes into us with our presuppositions, with our biases. And that is what the Apostle Paul means by dying to that tradition and allowing the Spirit of God and the Word of God to be the source of your interpretation of everything. Not just God's Word, but even life itself. Because we will color every event in our lives with our presuppositions. Go to any sporting event and watch an official make a call and listen to both sides. I can tell you how it will go. Why? Their presuppositions are biased. A couple of quotes that I think um, you need to hear in order to open up the possibility of a lot of different uh, understandings of this text. And to, you know, my wife is brilliant. When I was going through, my, you are. When I was going through seminary, um, I was an Arminian going to Reformed Theological Seminary because I knew that Reformed tradition had a lot of valuable things to teach me. And I needed to find out what the Reformed tradition could teach me. Now, I, I praise God for the education I got at a Reformed Theological Seminary because it helped me fill in the cracks that I was missing because of my Arminian upbringing. But I remember one time wrestling with the idea that um, some people really are convinced that they can lose their salvation, a lot what this text is talking about. And other people are sure to the perseverance of saints that once you've made a decision for Christ, you can never fall away. And I remember my wife who's not bound to any tradition, but takes God's word for what it was. She's, I remember her saying to me, well, Keith, maybe it's this way. Maybe God gives us the understanding of Hebrews 4, 6, 4 through 6, 6, 4 through 6, according to our temperament. And that those who are um, unsure of their faith need to hear about the perseverance of the faith. Perseverance of the saints. But those who are, tend to be cocky, and tend to be um, arrogant in their faith, they need to hear that they could lose their salvation. I asked my seminary professor that. I said, could that be? He never gave me an answer. You know why? Because to give her an, an answer would be against his tradition. And I took that to mean, my wife's on to something. Could the Spirit of God really speak to us personally? 
where the living, the, the word of God would be living and active? Oh, that's a novel. Oh, no, no, it's not. We covered that two weeks ago. I think that's what it means to be engaged with the Spirit of God. What it means to be engaged with the Word of God. That's why Paul and Barnabas can both be right when they argued at the end of Acts chapter 15. You ever thought about that? Some of you are going, what's at the end of Acts chapter 15? Well, look it up when you... Don't look it up now. I'm going to read these real quickly. Some point of this passage uh, to the prove that a backslider cannot be restored. But backsliders are not the subject here. This passage refers to people who walk with Christ for a while and then deliberately turn around and walk the other direction, rejecting Christ. Hebrews 10.26 says, For if we willingly persist in sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. These people can never be restored because they will not want to be restored. They have chosen to harden their hearts against Christ. It is not possible for God, uh, it is not possible for God to forgive them. Rather, it is impossible for them to be forgiven because they re- won't repent of their sins. Another quote uh, that's from uh, Raymond Brown. If we are not here dealing with a sincere believer, we are not here dealing with a sincere believer who is depressed about a spiritual failure or the backslider who has temporarily lost interest in the things of God. We are here confronted with fierce opposition to Christ and his public uh, gospel public rebellion against Christian things and uh, determination to bring Christ's work to an end. The force of their Christ rejection is vividly expressed in the tenses which are used here in the Greek in order to des- describe their activity. Such people keep on crucifying, present tense, for themselves the Son of God and keep on putting him to open sh- shame. Present tense again. If such people are resolute resolutely determined to respond in this way to the message of Christ's love and forgiveness, then certainly it is impossible to keep them on repeatedly leading them, present tense again, afresh into repentance. This is a person who has professed walking with Christ, and you say, well, he couldn't have really been walking with Christ because only those that walk with Christ can stay with Christ. I don't care! Do you do you really think we know how people's relationship with the Lord is, whether they're really walking or whether they're just faking it? We don't know that. That's why God's word is telling us and warning us. Stay true. Fight for the faith. Fight for your understanding of who Christ is. Fight for his, the understanding that he is our high priest and that we can rest in him. Okay, I need to go on. What warnings do we get in this section of Hebrews? Number four, your consistent, persistent commitment to build the kingdom of God in your life and the lives of other believers is evidence and assurance of your faith. This is what he says in in, uh, 6, 9 through 11. Even though we speak like this, dear, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. And we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end. Why? In order to make your hope sure. There's a quote in your sermon outline from a local theologian that every once in a while he has some insights that are worth listening to. Your willingness to set aside your own desires, wishes, and rights for the sake of others give great evidence of your spiritual maturity and should be a great source of comfort, security, and insurance that you are truly in Christ. When you can truly sacrifice for the sake of others and have absolutely no interest in receiving credit on your own, that should be great assurance to you that you are willing to sacrifice for Jesus and you're not in it for yourself. Now, if everything you do, you need to let somebody know, what, 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 that should be a warning. Why are you doing what you're doing? wrestle with these things wrestle with the fact that Jesus said when you do your good works do them before them good do them before men so that they may praise your father and then in just a chapter later he says when you do good works do them in the closet so that nobody knows what you're doing but Jesus which is it wrestle 
I was thinking as Michaela did her special. In order for you not to be childish, sometimes you have to be childish. It's like Proverbs. Answer a fool according to his folly and you'll become just like him. And the next verse says, don't answer a fool according to his folly so you can instruct him in the way. Which is it? Wisdom, maturity, knows what time it is and which verse to apply when. And Jesus has purposely set up what appear to be contradictory statements in order for us to know that it is not black and white and we could just do like the Pharisees did and check it off and walk this way and I am righteous. It is a 24-7, 365 relationship with the God of the universe in which you must be in touch with him at all times. You must give due diligence to his word and you must constantly check yourself to see if you're in tune with his spirit so that he can direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Please do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. In all your ways acknowledge him. In fact, in all... so that he can direct your paths. Worship point. True discipline is love. Worship the God who knows human nature well enough to warn against laziness, ignorance, and lack of self-discipline because God knows that if we yield to those inclinations, it could be the end of our salvation, confidence, and hope. The Christian faith is not a cakewalk. The Christian faith is a war. Over and over and over, the scriptures warn us. You must learn to fight for your faith, to fight for uh, your, your presuppositions, to fight for your understanding, to fight for your confidence and assurance. Gospel application. When we grab a hold of God's promises and hang on to God's revelation that if Jesus is our high priest, we will not fall away and our hope will be sure. That's why the writer of Hebrews has taken time off to scold the people that he's writing to in order to warn them, you need to wrestle with this idea that Jesus is our high priest in order to better understand what benefits are coming because Jesus is our high priest and not the guy down the street that's in the line of Aaron. That high priesthood has severe limitations and God has always known it because Jeremiah chapter... Oh, that's a spoiler alert. Spiritual challenge. Pick someone, preferably someone who is dead. Nobody finds that interesting. I'll explain. Pick someone, preferably someone who is dead, and imitate them in their faith Pers- uh, persistence and practice. Why do I choose somebody dead? So that they don't disappoint you when they fall away. <laughs> Pick somebody like Jonathan Edwards. John Wesley. John, oh, let's go off the Johns. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Billy Graham. <laughs> why, did, why did it? Chuck Colson. Wow. What a clear thinker. Eric Little. Eric Little? Who's Eric Little? Chariots of Fire guy? Read the rest of... Do like Paul Harvey. Read the rest of the story on his life. It is absolutely beautiful. Here's an Olympic champion dying, dying in China for his faith in obscurity. So what? You do not want to become a spiritual casualty because of laziness, ignorance, or lack of discipline. Nor do you want to see your brothers and sisters in Christ end up that way. Look to Jesus. See Jesus Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Consider Jesus and encourage others to do the same. 
Folks, in my lifetime, it's been amazing how our culture has gone from when I was a child and early adult to embracing the Christian faith and promoting the Christian faith as a culture. We promoted the Christian faith to now the point where if you're a Christian, shut up and get in the corner, you're out of line. That's basically the position our culture is taking towards, towards Christians. I want to end the message with another thought from William Bennett. Same message that he gave to the Heritage Foundation on uh, December 7th, 1993. Was that right, baby? December 7th, 1993. This is how he ends up. One will often hear that religious faith is a private matter that does not belong in the public arena. But this analysis does not hold at least on some important points. Whatever your faith, or even if you have no faith at all, it is a fact that when millions of people stop believing in God or when their belief is so attenuated as uh, to be belief in name only, enormous public consequences follow. And when this is accomplished by an aversion to spiritual language by the political and intellectual class, the public consequences are even greater. How could it be otherwise? In modernity, nothing has been more consequential or more public in its consequences than large segments of American society privately turning away from God or considering him irrelevant or declaring him dead. Dostoevsky reminded us in Brothers Karamazov that if God does not exist, everything is possible. We are now seeing everything. I don't know if you track with that or not. But folks, the reason why it's so important is because we have not been fighting the war for our faith over the last 20, 30 years. Christians have said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. I'll, I'll, I won't speak anywhere but in church. And in fact, they have some Christians so scared, they don't want to even speak out in church. We have the truth and the truth will set us free do not be timid in sharing that truth even if people hate you they need what we have and we've been conditioned by our culture not to share it don't go there fight Wrestle with the text. Wrestle with what it means to be a Christian. Wrestle with our culture. They need to hear what you have. We need to grow up and become what God wants us to be. A light on a hill.